Hi there, guys. Welcome to Jedi Journal. I'm Allie, and this is a co-host at Night nice Awakening, Charles McBride. Say hi, Charles. Hi, Charles. So, we were talking about the show Trusting Blindly in the Force, or Blindly Trusting in the Force, and we wanted to kind of expand on some ideas that Charles was throwing off at me, and we were just having a debate about it in the discussion, because this is something that is hotly discussed in the community. You have some people who are, do not trust the force at all, because it is, well, one of the metaphors, some people believe that, it's a metaphor. Uh, some people believe that you can't honestly understand the will of the force, so don't trust it because what you're what you're hearing is not actually the force. And then you have some that are on the other side who are like, oh no, that's the whole point of the Jedi. Well, if you didn't <laughs> if you didn't catch the episode though, um, you you want to go back and listen to it uh, after this episode or before this episode before you jump in. So first, I'm going to ask you, Paul, just to kind of give your idea of how you saw what you what you heard when it was me and Tuna talking. Uh, first, don't get into your your whole thing yet. I just want the reaction. Okay, so there was a lot of good stuff in it. Don't get me wrong. Um, there was a lot of stuff where I wasn't necessarily agreeing with it, but I wasn't completely disagreeing. Um, but what I guess. Like, I'm kind of not understanding the question, so I guess what I'm, uh, I guess my initial reaction was, okay, so this is a topic that everyone should be listening to, especially if they're in the Jedi community. And then my, my second reaction was, but not everyone who's in the Jedi community is practicing the Jedi arts. And that's one of the big problems. And then when the fiction got brought, brought up, I guess my next big reaction, should I hit that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my next big reaction was kind of like, yeah, but the, even in the fiction, not all of the Jedi trusted the people above them. And someone said, well, you know, trust in the Force, and they were, you know, a step above you on the ladder. You have guys like Qui-Gon, they were like, okay, well, that's fine. I will trust in the Force, as I feel it moved me. Um, you know, but even then, when you had a council and things like that, you had a council of people that was developed from a tradition that was passed down in the fiction over a thousand years, and they had weeded out things like bad actors and um, bad influences in it. And you had, what was it, five, ten dedicated people who sat in meditation trying to understand the will of the Force. That's your, that's your council of masters who sit there doing that. And the Jedi in the real world, I mean, I'm not as in the community as I used to be, but I still have some ties in it. I don't know of any of the groups that have a council of even three people that are sitting in meditation every single day trying to discern the role of the Force as something they're doing for more than 10, 15 minutes in a day. So when I say sitting there for a day, I mean like, okay, I woke up at you know 6 a.m., I start, I start uh, with my cup of, cup of tea and you know feeling the role of the Force. At 8, at 8 a.m., at 8 a.m., I take my first break. I take my first my first fifteen minute break and I come back at eight fifteen and start focusing on the role of the force again. And at ten a.m. I begin doing physical exercises to ready myself in case I have to fight the Sith Armada or whatever, whatever villain of the week is going to show up. And then after my physical training at you know twelve twelve p.m. I begin again focusing on the role of the force. I don't know of any group that has individuals dedicated in that way. Right. I don't. That, it would be difficult to find people to do that. In your line of work, for anyone who doesn't know, he runs a magical shop. Yeah. Magical shop. But do you prefer yeah. magical? Uh, the, the, the proper term is I'm a practicing professional mystic. That's the best way of putting it. Because not everything I do is magic. Not everything I do is necessarily honed in that way. Some things are more things like reading with tarot cards and things like that. Uh, some things are journey work, and a lot of times I act as a kind of counselor for people uh, providing advice on their destination, which oftentimes results in the words, well, it looks like you need to train harder, meditate longer. 
so much so. Kind of commented about how you can't do a whole episode about that unless you just put yourself on repeat for about ten minutes. I, you know what? That's the hardest part of doing doing the labyrinth too, is because I really want to sit there and be like, and if you trained harder, this wouldn't be an issue. But the caveat it's not that they got to train harder every day. It's you've got to cross certain thresholds where you're no longer proving things to yourself. So right. I run into a lot of neophytes that are trying to prove things for themselves. So that's a lot of what I run into is the whole, well, I don't know this or that, and I need to prove it to myself. And I'm at the point where I'm like, well, have you tried meditating for 12 hours in a row? Well, no, I couldn't do that. Why not? <laughs> is it you don't have time, or is it that you can't do it? Anyway, um, so a lot of what I do is so, diagnose too. Right, so in your, in your case, you actually have to be in a position where you can do that. But let's say in my case, where I'm primarily a stay-at-home mom, um, I do virtual assistant work, and I'm a security guard on the weekends where nothing happens. So, uh, you know, it's, I look at that, look at it from that perspective, and I have to recognize that a lot of people are in that situation where they don't have anything. They have to fight later on. So they don't have the pressing, the, the feeling of pressing me to actually get up and meditate and then do other arts that help hone them to a point where they can fight against it. We live in a in a country where we have the freedom to not have to worry too terribly much about that. Um, obviously, there are countries where they do have to worry about that. Off the top of my head, Iraq, Afghanistan, anywhere where terrorists happen to be very prevalent, and you have places in Africa that have that. And um, so, even having the, the, the feeling, okay, I need to get up and I need to do this, is difficult for the average person who's in the Jedi community. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't. But there are other things that you can go in and pedal against. For example, you've even said it, you have people in your life all the time that you can talk to, and they need, they need guidance. If you're in any position of leadership, that is something that you have to be tuned into with those people. It doesn't have to be the epic battle in a space war in, you know, Star Trek. It can be the battle of, of will to survive <laughs> in whatever environment. And this is something I was saying to my wife, too, and related that, you know, the Jedi in the real world aren't the Jedi in the fiction. No one has a career as a Jedi. Even even one of the people that has a career as a uh, soldier, I will use the proper term on that, who is a close friend of both of ours, he doesn't, at no point do they walk up to him and they say, look, what we need you to do is we need you to meditate for two hours today. So he gets honed in a very specific direction, even though he's got the whole warrior part of it, built in where yeah they're going to look at him and they're going to be like yeah hit the gym hit the gym for four hours they're not going to tell him hit the meditation pillow for four hours right so, that's him and he has to pick that he has to pick his times when he does that we have a lot of really good people i know one who was a, a mechanic who now i believe does software engineering really great individual in the community um not in the name names anyone who knows them know who i'm talking about though and i doubt while he's writing and debugging code or working on servers or whatever it is he's doing right now, that he has time to meditate while he's doing that. I've done tech work. I know you don't have time to sit in meditation. You can be in a meditative state. But that's that's very different from sitting there trying to discern the will of the force anyway. for, for, for four or five hours at a clip. He doesn't have five hours at the end of his day. If he has an hour... It's got to be focused on bettering him. So the idea of meditation, you know, the, the, which, that's where it gets into trying to form a real world council, like you see in the movies, to put an over guidance first, and then everyone else, you know, goes with their own second. I yeah, you know, I checked, and the mouse does not want to fund anyone to yeah. do that. Um. It is working on building uh, some advancements to its people trap that I've seen. We are now going to be able to catch people with distances between them in the trap. There's a six foot of distance in a giant people trap for a mouse to expedite the process of catching them. Um, but I don't 
expect that Uncle Georgie is going to show up in the bank roll us at any point. Um, you know, as a practice mystic, I always jokingly say that I can't take the name Jedi anymore, and it's true, I can't. I can't put it on a web page, I can't announce it, because if I do, it gets tied in professionally. But I still practice the arts, and it's still a core of a lot of what I do, because it's functional. So, also, like, for the people that don't know me from the old days, um, I'm not someone who doesn't know the community, or know the arts. I'm someone who, as a practicing mystic, knows that my world works better if I don't talk about Jedi things all over my website, all over That's my... Exterior. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, so we're kind of getting to this point where we understand, we understand that this is not something that can easily be done. So we can't build the same tradition that we have in the fiction to tie this all back to where, where we kind of got started with. It would be very, very difficult unless somebody wants to bankroll and pay me to do this job. Um, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> By the way, if you want to donate to KOA, I'm sure we're accepting donations somewhere. We would love to make this our, our actual job. Um, or at the very least, a part time job for Charles, since he's doing so well. <laughs> well, you know. Years and years back, when Ashley Knights was a big name, we knew we knew that uh, Master Thompson, the other Master Thompson, was uh, involved in investments and banking and things like that. We didn't no know way. what's that. No, no relation. Way. Very, very different. He actually looks more like me than he does like you. Um, but we we knew that he had a certain amount of funds. And that that was what let him keep the server. And this is back when I was dirt poor, and when uh, David was dirt poor, and Justin was just above dirt poor. And I remember Justin pulled us to the side one day because we said, "Well, I guess you know Master Thompson can bankroll all of this." And he's like, "How much?" He, he looks at us both and he goes, "How much money do you think he brings in in a year?" And I'm like, "I owe him oh, like a quarter of a million," and he's like. <laughs> a lot lower? Way lower. Oh. I guess he won't be bankrolling a temple then. But it's like, we don't have anyone in the community, even people that are well off, are not yeah. that well off. That, yeah. they could, that they could found a temple and pay everyone to meditate. Right. But, you know. Yeah. And if you're, in the, if you're in the real estate business like I am, and you see some of these prices of these houses that my clients selling and I will never live in the England area because of that. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so getting back on track because we do this all the time. We just go on I'm gonna try to focus this in. You and I were talking before we before I was like, hey stop, wait, just stop, let's let's not talk about this until I get us all recording. You and I were talking about the idea of understanding what the concept and understanding what it actually means to trust it. So let's let's go off that. Okay. So I'd be more than glad to. So first, if you're treating the horse as just a philosophy, um, none of what I'm gonna say applies. Because if it's just a philosophy, then everything is just psychological constructs, at which point you're just trusting your impulses, which is not safe or sane or rational. Um, if you've not been doing any kind of spiritual work to connect to this as an outside power and you're treating it only as a philosophy, this is my opinion. As a practicing mystic, this is what I would tell you if you sent me an email and told me this. I would say, stop, meditate, on this first until you can actually feel it. <laughs> because if it's just a philosophy, then obvious. I, I hope that it's obvious if it's just a philosophy. You don't trust that as a guidance then. Because that's basically saying do whatever you want and if you get hurt, so what? That That's un, that's an unsound way of reasoning. Now, if you are practicing extrasensory things that go with this, 
then the force is more of an explanation as to why all of that works. So from there, this gets into understanding it, and they kind of hit on this in Star Wars, and it was so beautiful that they hit on this in the first movie, and it's why an entire generation of people now practice energy work for all forms of mysticism, in my opinion, because this is where we all see it and we go, oh, that makes sense, and then we go do something else and we, we, we pull this in with it. Six? I Four. Episode four, yeah, episode four. So that first movie, episode four, there's a statement, and Luke asks everyone, so the Force tells us what to do. And everyone says, yes, but it also obeys our commands. And at that moment, you get this recognition that it guides you right in the direction you're pointing it to. And this is where we then get into, are you being guided in a direction that you're pointing that's functional, are you looking towards the future and then trying to, you know, manipulate yourself and the environment to prevent that or to bring it to be? Or are you only reacting on impulses? And this is, this is also where we get into, there's a big difference between uh, I feel the force and I'm a Jedi. Uh, this, the, that got covered in the next movie where Luke goes up against Vader and Vader goes, ah, the Force is strong with you, but you're not a Jedi yet. Yeah, you feel the Force, it's moving through you, it's guiding you, but until you've built systems of self-control and refinement in those moments that it's guiding you... Hashtag Jedi Code. Yeah, the Jedi Code, the Jedi philosophies and training, the hours and hours of meditation, and the physical training. Um, so I'll, I'm going to I'm going to sidetrack, but it's a story you've heard, and you know this is part of it, so it's not a real sidetrack. So I've done this for years, and I've focused on the extra sense rate a lot. And I can use it when I'm sword fighting. And with that, I have a glow stick that makes sound that we call a lightsaber. I want to make that really clear before someone goes, he's got a lightsaber. No, not like that. But I built, I built this one myself. Um, very nice little toy. And I'm playing with some kids of a friend of mine, and I've got my attention focused on the kid in front of me. And when you're playing with kids, when you're using a polycarbon piece of plastic, you, you pay really close attention because the kids will do more damage to you than the adults will. Because we adults pull our punches, kids, boom. Okay. So you will pay full attention to the child in front of you. And the other one comes running at me. And I don't know that the blade is coming, but I am, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to use the force as a way of controlling my movement so I don't hurt any of the kids, but so I also don't lose a finger in the process of this. And I feel something coming up towards that side, and I raise the blade up, because I was in the downward guard zone, and I go like that, and stop that kid's blade in mid-movement with my own. And she goes, oh, wow, you really can use the force. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. And your parents already told you that, but yeah. But my point is, that's a reaction where I'm guiding that flow to act in my own defense and the defense of everyone around me. Now, this is where I'm going to spread off from that. If I wasn't as well trained, or if I wasn't using it properly, that could have very easily been, oh, I sense danger. <laughs> and try to take the kid's head off with a piece of polycarbon on a metal handle. Right, which is actually something that you can see with cops. Yeah. For example, when they're out on the field, they may see something that's not necessarily there. And, um, and it's not because it wasn't there. It's because things aligned in such a way that it felt the intention somewhere. They didn't know what direction it was coming from. They were in the heat of their own their own adrenaline, which you know, if you, if you look at it, if you recall early in the Jedi community, we've kind of gotten away from it. We had three tiers of the force. There was personal force, which would be the adrenaline running through you, and, and all that hyped up energy that you have is the living force, and then there's the unifying or cosmic depending on how you want to look at that. They are technically different, but that's not for this discussion here. 
So I'm just letting you know, we did have that. So when you're, when you're relying on the force, you have these different parts of the force that you're relying on. It's all a one system, but you're more in tune with the one that's at the personal level. And you still, in the end, uh, like if you're in a fight with the one that's fellow described, you would want to tap into the living force because that's the most immediate connection that you have to everything. When you're in meditation and you're trying to speak and discern what the force wants you to do, for, this, for example, that would probably be more something that you connect with a cosmic or unifying factor. And it really just kind of depends on what you're, what you're trying to do with it. It's not really a hard, fast rule. No, that, that's good. But you would also want to meditate on where that personal force was guiding you at that point. Yes. Understanding the self, because it is way too easy to set dominoes up and tip yes. them in a direction and go, I've got to walk in this direction now. It, you know, the, the hardest thing I ever did in my entire life in terms of anything combat related, and anyone who knows me knows that I used to train to fight. Hardest thing I ever did was not walking into a fight. That took more because I knew that I had just set myself up to want to walk into that fight. And I had every reason to. And I could have wrote it off as self defense. And isn't that great to be able to say, I know I can check that box right now. I can get them to swing first. Right. And there's the thing that's not the force guiding me. That's not some higher understanding and it's certainly not coming from a point of peace and to knowledge. Yeah. It's coming from anger and rage. Yep. And that's where we get back to that code. You know, yeah. if you don't have that code the personal force gets in check with the code. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But not just the code. I mean I, I would also uh, well I would argue that at least with the values and the ethics that we were expansion of the code and peace uh, for us, we have the Jedi Compass. Mm -hmm. uh, other places they have, they expand further. The Jedi Compass being the lowest common denominator. Um, that is also why it's very basic for people to feel that I don't. Know. Say um, some of that again and project a little bit. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, <laughs> so the um, Jedi Compass is the lowest common denominator across several different documents that are used in the Jedi Compass. Such as the Jedi behaviors, which you can find on Wikipedia under um, how to follow the Jedi code or something like that. And just other little things. Uh, the 21 maxims, the 16 Jedi teachings, which also got up as high as, I think, 33 Jedi teachings. So we have all these documents, and those are used to expand upon how the Jedi code is supposed to be implemented into your life and the philosophy. Um, and so as it Concerns with the like in the Jedi Compass, we have a particular area that helps you better come in line, that overcome attachment, overcome aggression, and overcome recklessness. And these things help you align better with the rest of what the document says. And self awareness is a huge part of that. If you don't have self awareness, you can't overcome these things, these things and you can't realistically. Put yourself in check with anything that's in the, in the code or the rest of the philosophy. So this is actually one of, this is the, the crux of why Pressing Blindly in the Force, that episode, was about you need to put everything in check. It's not it's like you can't trust the Force alone. And what we're talking about is some of this very basic understanding that you may not be entirely tapped into what the Force is. You may be pointed in a direction that's not the right direction. If the world was always good and self is always bad, there's degrees on either side that we can just go to. It's really sad that they don't address this in in the movies at all. Like, you know, like maybe a moment where a, a fabled character of great wisdom and knowledge is guided to understanding of a threat of his apprentice ignites his lightsaber in a moment of misunderstanding. It's so sad that that doesn't exist in the movies at, at any point. Oh, wait. <laughs> that's the movie everyone hates, and I love that movie for one reason. one of my favorite movies, too. Actually, I have an episode where I draw exactly from that scene. I wrote it last night. <laughs> do, you know why I love, do you know why I love that scene? 
Because depending on who's telling it at different points in the movie, it's totally true for both people. Yeah. And they both have reason to see it the way they do. Yeah, even the first version of how he put it. Yeah. But he tells the story twice. Yep. And and then he goes back to what Qui Gon said. Or not Qui Gon. Um, Obi Wan. Obi Wan in the original three films where he's like it's uh, it's from a certain point of view. Mm -hmm. And that's just beautiful because you see how Luke takes that and puts it forward. But I want to caveat that Luke, as a grand master, knew that there was danger, ignited his lightsaber, and realized that he probably shouldn't chop people up until they've done something wrong. And this is where we get into, are you skilled enough in the Jedi arts as a Jedi to be a Jedi while you're trusting this guidance, or are you still at that level where you're going to react on the impulse? Yeah. And that's, that's the big crux of this. Yeah, you may sense that there's someone in need, and that's easy to deal with because you get guided to where they're at, and you go, oh, okay, I can help this person. And that, right. that's, that's when it works well. Yeah. And you're able to help them. You need to know how to help them. Right. right. But if you're able to help them, that's, that's where it works well. Where it works poorly is when you see someone having a mental breakdown and you sense danger coming from them and you go, someone's got to stop this person and rather than calling for the police or calling for an ambulance and a medical team, you go, it's a good thing, good thing I'm here with the force. <laughs> the force in my right arm and the force in my left arm. I need the energy here before you start to freaking call somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I need an ambulance over here. <laughs> Right, or, or you, or rather than, you know, that's what he said, maybe that maybe you try to do energy healing, and the person's bleeding out, well, that's not the time for energy healing, this is where you need to disconnect from your predisposition at that moment, and apply pressure to the wound, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's, there's this certain level of awareness that is written into the characters that inspire this philosophy that some of us are there some of the time and some of us are not there some of the time. Most of us are not there some of the time. Ever. Yeah. And, and that's something else that we have to recognize is that some of us are not there ever. Yeah. And if you're not there, you can't trust the will of the force to guide you because you're not at that level of self-awareness to know that you're feeding your own ego by trying to rake a bullet wound through the through the liver, yeah. You know, you've not hit that point where you're self aware enough to go. Oh, I should be applying pressure to the wound and calling an ambulance. You're you're still at that phase of, oh, I've got to satisfy this part of my ego. And wouldn't it be great if I healed this wound with, with the force? I'd be like, yeah, that would be fantastic. Do that while applying pressure and calling an ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it doesn't work. Yeah, like, if it works, fantastic. Now, not only are you a legend, but you're a hero. But, and this gets back to that whole, you, you can define Jedi a lot of times with one word and it's hero. But, if you don't, if you are still applying pressure to the wound, you're still a hero. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, even that means you've seen shows where they expand on how heroes can go terribly wrong when they don't do the right thing. Like, there's a, um, what is the name of that show, The Boys, on Amazon? And it is a fantastic point of how people want. They have this ability. They actually have the ability, and they go out and they try to use it for good. And sometimes they get it wrong, and sometimes they are so full of themselves yeah. that it goes awry. So you, you have all this stuff working together, and it's it doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad. And of course, as they say in the movies, the force has both good and bad. And brave, brave words there. He's like, your problem was Luke, you thought his whole thing was decided. You thought that's what the force was telling you. And you can't trust the force alone. The force did you pick this? Yep. It doesn't give you the whole story. And, 
that was the point in the movies that they seen visions, but they couldn't necessarily be certain where the visions were leading them. And, you know, none of us measures up to Yoda. Okay? Oh, I get that. But no, hear me out, hear me out, okay? I, at my best, have moved a pinwheel with telekinesis once or twice, maybe got a candle flame to dance a little bit. And that was when that was all I focused on. But I don't ever recall lifting a 747 or a jet fighter out of a swing. No, mm -mm. I, I wouldn't be able to lift a flashlight like that. Much less, much less a jet fighter that's designed to enter the atmosphere and leave it and has... No, just no. But these characters are written larger than life. And I, I honestly think that was part of the point of the movies, was that they're larger than life and they're failing. Yeah. You know, if they're like, you can't face Vader if you do, everything's over and, and you lose completely. And yet, facing Vader was the first step to redeeming Vader. Yeah. So, he can't trust his visions and what he knows is coming any better than Luke can, because Luke sees the vision and goes, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to save my friends because I've seen a vision. Instead, he loses a hand and starts taking steps towards embracing his anger. Yeah. You know? so so legitimately, if you guys want to trust the Force in the way that Yoda did, the only way that you can say that is if he was a Sith. And he was directly trying to misguide Luke so he would not go to him. It's way too easy to make Yoda into a bad guy. As much as I love Yoda as a character, um, but that was the thing. All the characters are flawed. You know, Mace Windu doesn't uh, see that justice is done and tries to deal with himself in a situation where he's disarmed the foe. You know, let's not get into all the Anakin's flaws. Qui-Gon, Qui-Gon basically sets in motion the downfall of the entire Jedi Order because he feels like this kid is the chosen one. Yeah, maybe the kid is the chosen one. But that's why you confer with a council of eight other people who are masters in this, to find out if it's a good idea. You don't just be like, I would not train the boy. No, but that was the point, was that these downfalls happen from arrogance, and that arrogance is sneaky, because arrogance... But you yeah. know, all people will still say that because of Qui-Gon, the balance was restored. But you're absolutely right. We can't, we want that to be the story. We want that to be the story. Yeah, but the story also involves, what, you know, 500 kids getting slaughtered by the great hero of the, of the Republic? Yeah. Like, do we really want to say that's the balance of the Force? Would it, the whole story, the whole point of the prequels, was that arrogance masquerades itself as wisdom nine out of ten times. Yep. And this is where you had brought up previously, and I don't want you to lose, lose that statement, what if you sent someone behind you? And you know you sense that they're a threat, so you turn and you're drawing a firearm, and you shoot, and then you find out they weren't a threat at that moment in that way. Maybe they were a threat because they were a bad person, but they didn't have anything in to you. And my response to that, because like I said, I didn't want to. Well, do you want to hit on that further first? Yeah. So okay. So it kind of really goes back to like the whole situation of space. Situation like you can feel evil and kind of And, um, well, you know, they're fooling him. They're trying to get to you, and they've got that malicious uh, emotion to them. You know, like if you feel someone staring at you evilly, and you just know the evil eye is on you, you look at him and you're like, why are you staring at me? <laughs> uh, it's very much the same, and so you can, you can have this idea that there is someone behind you, malicious intent, and you're, and knowing that that's there, you turn around, and you see that it's all that turns out is that they actually just had a video camera, or, or even worse, if you hit the wrong person because you went the wrong direction, you roll around too fast, and maybe the person who actually had the gun, it's just a couple of degrees over there. And so then they uh, they hear the bang and let's just say that they don't they don't fire back because they get scared of it. They suddenly drop their weapon. But now you hit somebody else. It's a complete accident. You know that it's there. But if you're not 
focus and hone in on how you can determine where that is and what's going on, you're screwed. And that's actually one of the reasons why it's trained into, into police officers to look closely. You return fire with aim fire. That's not just police, that's military too. Return fire with aim fire, you don't just non-homely shoot in the direction because you think it's coming from that direction. You have to know that it's coming from that direction. After Texas fire, gotcha, you're in the middle of an MSO route. Uh, I don't know why I've been of being just slow change for route, but you're out there on an MSR and there's nobody else out there. And you know for a fact it's coming from that bomb over there. Then yeah, you can return fire that basic direction, but fire at the bomb, don't fire just above it because you don't know what else to get hit next. You want only what's going to get hit underneath the bomb for suppressing fire because you know that's where it's coming from. So it's still aimed fire. The, the, the word you said there was return fire too, not preemptive yes, fire. Exactly. Not preemptive fire unless you unless they are unless you can actually see them poking a weapon at you. Like it's, and and that's why it's so complicated and and so heart wrenching for a police officer if they return fire at a at a state gun. Because sometimes you cannot tell. Not in the dark, you can't. That's for sure. Tell. So, and, and it's heartbreaking. If no heart really breaks, then you should know that. And you try to justify it, yes, but that's because they're trying to find anything to grapple with the situation. So, you know, my little defense of the police today, but that's my point. If you, can, if you don't have trained understanding and you're not specifically trained in your own body, which is why there is more to the Jedi arts than just focusing on the force. There's training. Lots of training and other things. Physically honing yourself for whatever job it is you play. So my my next thing is this. If you're turning and you sense a threat behind you, this is where we get into are you following the force and acting as a Jedi while you do that, or are you following the fact that the Force is giving you an impulse and you're now reacting as an animal, as a human being with an animal in the, the, the animal world known as, known as a human being? Because I'm not, I'm not calling you animalistic for it. I'm not saying you're a bad person. So I'm calling you animal kingdom. Yeah, I got you're, you. You're acting as an animal in the animal kingdom known as a human, and... You're letting that impulse dictate what happens next. Because if you're following the force as a trained Jedi, then you're turning now trying to find out what the force is guiding you to. So you're seeking knowledge over ignorance. You're trying to defend yourself and all of those around you, including whoever might be a threat to you. You're trying to protect them from a deadly encounter with you. Are those the things that are in your mind and in your heart? Do you know yourself well enough to say that? And are, are you honest enough? The mindfulness in those situations is very difficult. And, and that's another reason why you train to my face. Yep. The mindfulness itself has to be the key that you actually manifest in all of this. And I think in the communities, we have a lot of people that are more arrogant than they are wise. They believe they've got it. They don't have it live fire tested. Um, I wasn't happy with that myself, so I live fire tested a lot of things. Um, I've had my nose broken three times in a single hit, which is why it's so bulbous now. Um, I've taken swords across the head. Yep. And the worst part was I yeah, supposed to... For it. I think we've got a photo of it still. We do. And you know what the worst part is? I was supposed to spar with you that day. And I couldn't. Because I was like, no, I will not... Either I won't have control or you won't have control and this will go badly. But that was that was self-awareness. I wasn't letting arrogance mask itself as wisdom. I got this, Allie. Just, <laughs> just don't move to the left too much. <laughs> just go swinging a piece of lumber at your head. Um, we're getting hit in the head again myself. There's, there's the thing. They mistake the fact that they can enter this state of calm as having achieved it in a perfect state. That's something that you do through testing and through practice and through 
through pushing the limits or or you go the other way of wisdom and you don't trust that guidance without a filter. So if you don't have all of that training to react and let that guidance move you in the direction that you're moving in, then you give yourself a delay filter and you go, no, I'm going to think thoughts. I'm going to going to use that big old brain of mine, the advantage that the animal kingdom gave me, and process this information before I draw a gun, before I start shooting people behind me, and actually look and go, eyes can see things, and I see details, and I see kid with an ice cream cone, I see someone with a cell phone photographing me who doesn't like me and doesn't and wants to put me on YouTube. Well, yeah, that's a threat. Either way works. You, you can either have that severe degree of training and then be trusting that guidance and be putting that time and effort in, or you can run that filter ahead of time. But both of those results in not drawing a gun as you're turning around, aiming it blindly at the first thing that registered a split, and firing it. And this is where we get into, I think, too many people who practice the idea of Jedi as a religion automatically think that that instills some mystical art that bequeaths itself from the heavens and gives them perfect guidance. And... Maybe it does give them some guidance if they're, if they're training the art form, but it's not going to be perfect unless they started perfecting themselves internally, perfecting how they deal with those responses. Like, do you know what the right response to an adrenaline dump is? In my estimation, at least. The best response to an adrenaline dump is to stop, take note of your surroundings, and then formulate your plan. That adrenaline is giving you time. Everything slows down during an adrenaline dump. You are now aware. You now have five seconds for every second. Actually, it's, it's closer to like ten. It really feels like ten seconds for every second that passes. When that adrenaline dump hits, you now have ten seconds to think through things for every second of reaction. That is more than enough time to go, oh, ice cream cone, not a gun. Cell phone, not a gun probably shouldn't shoot anyone right now. So, okay. Now, there's another aspect of this. You're talking about it, from, or what we have been talking about it, is one of the ideas that the force gives you kids. But, throughout history, and this is, this is the point of, uh, this is something that we, we should acknowledge, we're not Jedi just in the We're not talking about just Jedi in the picture. We're talking about real world. And if you look at the real world and you look at what Lucas was doing, he even told people in his, um, in his interview with film lawyers that it was supposed to be there to make you question if God exists. And he, he didn't necessarily say he cared which God you end up following. I mean, you know, his. You know, well, he was using the term God in the bigger, the bigger way. Where you start stopping, where you stop looking at books and you start looking at experiences. Well, he wasn't just talking about it from that perspective, though. Because, I mean, we all know that, well, we all. If you know anything about him, you know that he identified for a long time, if not so now, as a Methodist. Yes. So the God that he decided to follow was a God who, in the Bible, legitimately speaks. Mm hmm so we know that, that that God can communicate, and we also know that throughout history... Now, what, what, what language does he speak in? <laughs> well, he's, he's supposed to be able to speak in any language, to create it, you know, or to be involved with, or learn them as they... Whatever! He's created, evolved... I'm not really sure the right word for this one, on how he able to speak any language, but he is able to speak any language. He's God, okay? He's I'm, I'm going to come back to that later, so you know, I'm just planting that like a seed, and as a good gardener, I'm going to let you water it for me. My point is, though, is that Christianity is not the only one that has a God that speaks to man. And uh, Socrates, actually, he believed that he had, it's what you would basically call a personal God, 
Damon. Which, who knows how they actually said it beforehand, since we're getting into linguistics. But, Damon is the way that we would say it today. Uh, it, it's his personal God that was sent to him and gives him uh, information. And we hear about this like only once not during his trial. Where the one that Plato, I think, Plato, who just quoted it. And towards the end, he says that the reason why he, he opted in is because of exile, basically, is because he was saying so, he was like, didn't tell me not to, didn't tell me to. It just kind of seemed like it was that's the direction it was going to go in. So, I could have done that or something else. So, he goes in exile, but the whole point is that he was in communication with it. He was talking with it. And the personal, personal gods, or even just in general, the gods, the great news that they were talking about. Uh, well, some of them did. They would get oracles and they were prophets at the time. Um, they audibly heard these voices. So, you can't just look at it and say, well, okay, it's just kids there. Because there are examples throughout history where it is audible. God. Now, what those are, we could go into lots of different theories, whatever. I'm not here for theories, I'm just here for the basics. This is this is a defined truth that we have for our history. So let's say that this God uh so actually no we use one out of the Bible. We'll use an example. So Yahweh goes in and he says, Hey, I need you to kill off everybody in Jericho. You're gonna kill them all off. Joshua, and, or Joseph, rather, Joseph and a few other people, no, it is Joshua. Joshua and a couple people go in, they end up brokering a, um, brokering a truce with one of the families there, a particular woman, who was a harlot, and that family is the only one that survived. God was a little bit upset about that because they were supposed to kill them all. But he allowed it because he was like, well, you guys made the, made the pack, and... I'm somebody who, who's very much about packs, so I'm not going to make you break that one. That's the blanket, though. Go in, women, children, doesn't matter who they are, kill them all off. This was sold to them. This yep. was their information. So, as Jedi, you look at that. Do you trust the Force? So, so here's it's, my thing. Assuming that that's what you would akin to it. Not everybody yeah. God see the Force, but I'm just saying. Assuming that the Force did something like that. So, two things. Number one. Again, what language did it speak in? The reason I asked that, I planted the seed early because I wanted to grow this tree, and I knew you'd water it for me. So, any external... Anything that can talk to everyone all at once could not be talking with language. Why is it that the grammar of the thing that speaks is always in a grammar more or less like our own? The words are put together in the subject verb agreements that we understand. Why does it follow our structure if it's a vast, infinite thing? Because you're getting an impulse that's being turned into words in your brain. Because this here, this here likes to store information. This is my reason. Well, okay, this is the thing. If you go from that perspective, then you're actually not helping your argument. Because let, let me put it to this. Let me put it in this way: we're not talking when we're talking about something like this. I mean, talk to people who believe that, not to be, not to give them something that you can explain away. You can explain away that. I want you to come from the position of that is actually what's going on. That's, a lot, that's hard for me because that's hard for me because um, and again, if there are any giant mice listening, this is not me uh, making the claim. But I have always went with the idea that the force is separate from everything is an undercurrent. So if the force is talking to me, I always ask who is talking through the force. In 
I'm looking for something and getting information, so it's very hard for me to approach from this position by a attempt. Okay? I will make the attempt for you, Abby. <laughs> um, and for, for our valued watchers and listeners. So, I'm there and I hear this voice. And I am convinced that I'm not having a psychotic break. Correct. That's going to be tough. Because at that point, that's the first thing I would assume, is I'm having a psychotic break. We'll assume that I went past and I believe that it's... Let me put you in a very particular position so that you know... I already have, but keep going. Uh, I haven't put you in this position, but I haven't... All, uh, what I did not give you is being actually Moses. That's who was delivered the information. So, yeah. as Moses, you have to understand that he's been talking with God up to this point. So, okay, so... So yeah, the mystic voice has been correct up to this point. Yes. Oh. So that that's that's the problem that you're running into. So it, it's not just a matter of you know it, it, you didn't just drop this on you. You you've been in communication this whole time. You've been so, through the you've been through everything, and you you seen it all happen as he said it would happen. So this is the position that you're in now. So. Within this, and I want to, I want to put some more context on this. Moses was not a Jedi in the story. No, you're right. So and, and that's, that's how he gets from point A to point B on this. Right. Okay. But assuming that Moses has somehow navigated being a Jedi up to this point, with all the firstborn sons dying and the Fu and the Han, the terrible wrath, and he hasn't had a question of faith yet. Whew, arrogance really doesn't ask itself as with him. <laughs> <laughs> and he's now got God as the force going, go do this thing. I can't see how he wouldn't agree at that point. He would have to agree because, you know, the high sky voice has been right up to this point. But here's the thing. I would disagree with him having been a Jedi from the start of it all the way up to the finish. Because he agreed. But I can't see how he wouldn't agree. Now, had Moses been a Jedi, um, I don't know the story as well as you do. So there may have been other. There may be. There may be time. There may be a point before this point at which his his Jedi training would have kicked in. But I think at the moment it was like, oh yes, and we're going to uh, kill all the firstborn sons of Egypt. As a Jedi, I'd be like, whoa, God, hold up there. I don't think I can. I can let this go through. At which point, if God wanted to get into a fist fight with me, that's up, that's you know, between me and God uh, for however short that fist fight lasts, since apparently he can kill all the firstborn. And but as a Jedi, his training should have kicked in to seek peace and protection of all, even those that he was fighting against. And he should be like, look, those firstborn hadn't done hadn't done anything. If you want to kill the Pharaoh off, have it. <laughs> But uh, a little, little more, uh, as an old Jedi master once said to me, a little more precision, a little less accuracy. You're hitting your target, and everyone else's too. So this is this is where we get to that a Jedi in the modern world. Well, are they actually a Jedi if they're listening to the voice at that point? And I would say no, because they started listening, but they weren't trusting the code, and they weren't trusting the Force to move them. They're trusting words. In words, that's a higher level of intellect. And then once you hit that higher level of intellect, that's where I start dividing Jedi from I'm this other thing first, but I practice Jedi arts. Well, and, and that's just it, though, is that there are people out there who contribute the force to God. Like, legitimate Christian yeah. God, or legitimately... Even in the European pantheon, I could see uh, I could see it happening where they would attribute Odin and Thor. To Probably the world tree. They would attribute the world tree as being the force. Okay, that's a fair point. I mean, I've actually had someone argue that Loki is the force. Yeah. I have. I have actually I got He's that out of the paper. But you know, this is this is the other thing too. The force does not imply a lack of other forces, either within it. Or outside of it, and that's that's actually my position. I, I don't know. If, I mean, I know Charles knows that, but other people don't. So my position actually is, is that God is not the force; He is a will within the force, and uh, so, so there's that. Um, and so, as a Jedi, 
one of the I said it in the last in the last episode on blind reception before, but I'll say it again. In my training program, you actually have to analyze if you're doing bachelor's program a god against the Jedi compass in the code. Yeah. And you have to determine are they going to ever ask me to go against it? And if they do, who takes priority? Because this question is not just about whether or not um, you, you trust the force. It's do you trust a divine will that is supposed to be way above your own in, in human understanding, which may or may not be the force? And, and that's the key there. Is that it could, if you believe it to be the force, and you have to make a determination, are you going to follow what the force says if it's telling you to do something that's against the compass and code? Or are you going to be the Jedi and get killed? Because you to hit on that further, this is why you see so many debates, and you'll see me often come in on the side of what I guess would be fundamentalist Jedi, uh, where, where it's very much the Jedi is its, is its thing, and you can be a Jedi and be something else, but you can't be something else and then be a Jedi. you got to be that first in a lot of arguments, because in my mind, once you're putting something else above that force, and its guidance as a non non verbal thing and recognizing your own part you play in moving that guidance in a direction. And recognizing that yes, you may see vast amounts of knowledge and information, but you're still living in a limited human body and that you've got to realize that you're paring that down to a limited human body and its perceptions. Once you stop doing that and you go, I'm going to blindly follow X. So I'm now this plus Jedi. But once you do that, you're no longer Jedi. You're this that practices the Jedi arts. And you often see that's why I say I often come on when I do enter the groups and have the discussions. Uh, when I show up and people rave alarm bells, oh my god, he's here and he's posting. Um, that actually happened once from my understanding. They had a council meeting, a group did, because I made a post. And it was just high. It wasn't even anything inflammatory. I was like, hi, guys. <laughs> um, but when you do that, when you start doing, you know, this plus Jedi, you're not really in adherence with any of the codes or ideas. You're practicing the arts, which means you're doing the meditations, you're practicing the martial skills. You're, you're, like you're a force realist. You're a force realist, yeah. But you're not necessarily a Jedi then, and I, I draw that hard line, and a lot of people didn't understand. I did a show a few years back that was, you can't uh, be a Jedi and have another re religion, and people didn't get what I was saying, is you can't sit there and have this other thing above what this is, and then expect to meet the criteria of it. So you're either a Jedi first, and a Christian second, or you're a Christian first, and because if God says drop this village, you're going to go drop the village. You can't be a Jedi. Because even God in the Bible allows you to go against him if he gives. They just stop you because you've all, you're already um, ruining my assignment here. <laughs> no, I'm not because the thing is, they're free to disagree with me. They are. Because I, I may get talked about in old circles from people who know me from the past as Charles Effing McBride. But that doesn't mean that that's who I am to these people. To these people, I'm the host of the Labyrinth, and I talk about mysticism stuff, and if they're Christian and they're not practicing any of the art forms that I do, they haven't went through their mental hoops to find the yes or no on it, or they, they, went, through, they, went, through, they went through their mental hoops and they said no. Well, then they're just like, yeah, it's BS, whatever Charles thinks is BS, and that's fine. They can write that off, and this doesn't ruin their assignment because I'm just some, some mystic trying to pervert them. On the other side of that, if they went through their hoops and they're Christian and they practice some of the art forms that I teach, then they're there going, oh, well, I need to rethink that, which they should be rethinking it anyway, because they're already rethinking things. Right. But actually, uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of time to do a closing statement. Okay. Yeah. A closing statement on this, because I, I feel like we kind of, what this was is, Allie wanted me a chance, wanted a chance for me to really get up here and and do my song and dance because she knows I'm I'm good at singing and dancing. 
my closing statement on this. Uh, if you're going to call yourself a Jedi, there's a lot that goes into defining that. It's a lot easier to embrace arrogance over wisdom and over self-control. And once you do that, it's a very short road to trusting voices, trusting immediate reactions, trusting impulses, and to trusting in something that anyone else who had conquered arrogance would tell you that's not the force, as the force. And that with that dividing line, we have to recognize that the only way to hold that line is to be in a constant state of introspection when you deal with new information, when you deal with visions, when you deal with senses, when you deal with impulses. Once you give up that dividing line, once you say, I have mastered X, Y, and Z and cannot be wrong, you are now trusting ego. And ego will move the force right in the direction that makes ego right. At which point the person with the cell phone Actually, you're sure they had a gun on them somewhere. We're about to draw it. The kid with the ice cream cone was a vicious ninja assassin in hiding. You'll find an excuse. And that's where the problem is. Do I think people can trust in the force and it guides them? Yeah, I've seen it work countless times. I've also seen it fail countless times. Because that self-awareness and that introspection can fail. And that's why you take time to be introspective. It's why you hone introspection, and it's why you hone a pause in a reaction. Because there's a big difference between I felt danger and I need to immediately react with deadly force. Going back to the old Star Wars books and novels, my last closing statement, it is better to die not having ignited your lightsaber then they have ignited it for the wrong reason. That's my closing statement. And my closing statement shall be this. If you think that person the force is only not. <laughs> the reason that I tell you not to trust the force but to put your trust in the Jedi path and not in another person is because that is what's going to guide you to point you in the direction that the force needs you to go. It's not saying you disregard the force. Not at all. It's about the language that we use. If I say trust the force, people take that and run with it the wrong direction. If I say trust the philosophy, then you actually have something to see in the past. So, do you trust the force? Do you trust the force? No. No, I don't. I think that's the right way to put it. I think it's let the force be your ally. Because that's what it's supposed to be. An ally. An advisor. But everything has to be filtered through the lens of the Jedi path. <laughs> and on that note, it's time for us to run. I hope that you... Let's, let's do this together, Carol. One, two, three. Oh, wait. In the night within. <laughs>